I am Hazel Dixon, and I am interviewing uh, Mrs. Kent Johnson of Alva, Oklahoma, 1103 Locust Street. Uh, her maiden name was Grace Montel, and her father's name was Christian Henry Montel. Her mother was Bertha Carter. They came from Indiana, and her father came to Alva in 1898, then went back to Indiana and got her mother, and they were married, and they came back to Alva and spent the rest of their life here. Um, she has, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Johnson have two sons, K. Montel Johnson of Alva and Norval D. Johnson of Alva. Mrs. Uh, Johnson's father was an attorney here in the early days, and uh, we are going to ask her something about her life here and his life here in the early days. Mrs. Johnson, uh, what did your father do here? Uh, he was an attorney, was he not? That was all he did. Uh -huh. uh, he, a lot of people uh, came and did other things. And uh, Papa did not come, my parents did not come at the opening of the Strip uh, five years later in 1898 when they were married in my mother's home in Indiana. They immediately uh -huh. came out to Alba. And uh, I was born here. the next year and uh, I feel that I'm very fortunate in living in the era that I have. I remember Alva as a child, a, a town built around a square with uh, board sidewalks, unpaved streets, false front buildings. The majority of the buildings were saloons or livery stables with a few uh, few other places of business in between. And uh, it was, uh, we've had some terrible fires here in livery stables where many, many beautiful horses have burned and it always caused people heartache. The, uh, they had, uh, hitching posts around the square and water troughs for the horses, the teams, because of the uh, trade had to come in from their farms. And the uh, Alva was the county seat of M County in Oklahoma Territory. When Oklahoma became a state, they uh, made three counties from M County, which was is Major County, Alfalfa County, and Woods County. And uh, my father uh, was county attorney for uh, M County. But when Oklahoma became a state, it was predominantly Democrat. He was Republican, and he, uh, he was not elected, which was probably a good thing for him because he went ahead and did more. Uh, when they came here, they at first stayed in the old Hendrickson Hotel, which is, which was later called the Runny Meat Hotel. That hotel was brought down in sections from Runny Meat, Kansas, and reassembled here. It was built in Runny Meat, Kansas. That is, there is a plaque on the highway on the as you go toward Wichita on Highway 2 and 42 into Wichita from Harper. You'll see this plaque that uh, Old Running Meat was uh, there at one time, and it was a. It had been built by parents in England who were trying to do something with wayward sons. It was uh, th those boys, those men were remittance men, just like many of the millionaires in Colorado and California and around were remittance men. Their their family sent them money. Well. As today, the parents send their hippie children money and say, don't come home. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but it finally didn't work out, and so the uh, hotel was brought down here and reassembled. And it was the Hendrickson when they stayed in it. It's had many names since. And right now, 
the et cetera shop is in there. It's still in good shape, isn't it? it looks nice, yes. Yes, yes, it, it really does. Mm -hmm. uh, while uh, they stayed there, the architect and the uh, contractor for the large building, the castle on the hill, as we used to call the main building of uh, Northwestern, was being built. The story goes that at one time they had a teacher's institute here in Alba. Now that was before my parents came. They had a teacher's institute and uh, a, a young man and his two sisters came in from the country to go to this institute to uh, become licensed to teach. And they, uh, they lived in a tent and they brought all their provisions. And it, on the weekend, this boy would trudge home. And I don't know whether he was brought back or what, maybe the family brought him back, but he'd go home for supplies for the next week. And the businessman of Alva said, if those young people desire an education so much, we should do something about it. Now, I feel sure and, I, and I'm sure there are men whose names I do not remember, and I, I don't mean to leave them out intentionally, but I, I think that John Monfort, Jack Ross, Ed Kelly, and others worked to bring this uh, about. And when they were in the uh, legislature, the territory legislature, the, some of these men, and I think Jack Ross was among them, well, they went down there, and of course, as uh, all legislation is horse trading, the legislators from down around McAllister said, if you will vote for us to have the penitentiary, we will vote for you to have the school. And that was how Northwestern uh, Territorial Normal School was established. The first president was James E. Ament, and it was his idea and his desire to have that building resembling the castle built. It was, it, he was the guiding light there. And uh, um, I have to cut that. Uh, President Alment was no doubt a very uh, worthy administrator. But he had uh, some ideas. He felt that he was a very important man. Senator Miram lived in Woodward, had a law office there. He was one of the legislators. His partner was the well-known Temple Houston, son of ha Sam Houston. So one day, uh, President Ament decided he had some things in mind that he wanted to discuss with Senator Miram, so he went down to Woodward, and when he reached the office, Senator Miram was in conference, but uh, Mr. Houston asked him his business, and he said, I am President James E. Ament of the Northwestern Territorial Normal School at Alva, and I wish to see Senator Miram. Mr. Houston answered, uh, the senator uh, is busy but uh, and in conference, but he will see you shortly. Please take a chair, which President Ament did. But he felt, after a little bit, that his he wasn't being seen soon enough, so he went back. And he said to Mr. Houston, I am President James E. Ament of the Northwestern Territorial Normal School in Alva, and I would like to see Senator Mayor. Well, yes, sir, yes, sir, the senator's in conference, but he'll see you soon, just have a seat. So he, Mr. President Alment, sat down and waited a bit, and he came back the third time and went through the same statement. This third episode rather irked Mr. Houston, so he said, the hell you say, take two chairs. <laughs> 
And, uh, he didn't impress him very much. No, he didn't. Uh, there were, uh, at the time my father came here, there were uh, several lawyers in Alva. I may forget some. I know there was Colonel Snoddy, his two sons, Erskine and Claude. Claude died early. Erskine Snoddy died not too many years ago. Uh, T.J. Womack, uh, Harry Noah, Thomas Goodwin, Jesse Dunn, who afterwards became uh, a justice on the Oklahoma Supreme Court, F.M. Cowell, and Jack Ross, who was also a newspaper editor. Uh, they they were and of course then my father after he came these others were here earlier they were here when the strip opened in 1893 on the 16th of September mm -hmm. and uh, we've had a newspaper here every minute since I believe uh, they they took the uh, press, the first press went up to Kiowa, I believe, and uh, printed there and brought back on the train. And then uh, Mr. Ross, he set up his printing press in a tent. And uh, at first, and the, there were it was a tent city almost to start with. Of course, a lot of people came here. They had money. Uh, the shares, the share brothers came here. They had money. They had been in Harper, Kansas. Uh, Louis Miller came from uh, Harper, and he and his mother, and well, I guess his father too. But uh, uh, they were had been in business in uh, Harper, and he came down here and opened a furniture store with undertaking in the back. Uh, they carried not too many supplies in their undertaking business. They ordered. Uh, when they saw somebody couldn't live, then they would order in a casket or what. And uh, I know that my mother was almost dead when I was born, and they, uh, they were told to order her casket. And this young boy, he was a cousin of, Will, of uh, Louis Miller's, and was reared by Louis's mother, Will Foote, who so many people here know, said he, he got down on his knees and prayed that Mama would be spared. And she was. And, uh, well, let me see. You were telling something about Temple Houston well, yesterday. Yeah, well, that was the one about taking two chairs. He told uh, Aunt Ant to do that. Oh, yes, he was a, a rather short man. He wore high-heeled cowboy boots. He wore his hair uh, down straight from his head, uh, hanging to his shoulders, and uh, he had a pockmarked face. But uh, he carried himself with a courtly air, and he was very, he was very considerate of women. He, uh, at one time, when, when uh, I may digress here, but I guess I can come back. Edna Ferber wrote Cimarron, which is a story of Oklahoma. Uh, the main character, male character, Yancy Cravat, has, uh, is a composite figure. He uh, was, she took his law business from Temple Houston. She, she read about that, and she took that from Temple Houston. His newspaper work she took from Governor, Territorial Governor Thomas Benton Ferguson, who lived in Watonga. And just recently has Ferguson's old home been refurbished and opened to the public. Uh, so he, he patterned that, and in that story where Yancey Cravat is the attorney for and the, the uh, woman of the streets, his 
speech that Yancey makes is verbatim for a speech that Temple Houston made in Woodward in defense of one of the, his clients, and he got her acquitted. Another time, uh, my father was down in Woodward. They were trying a man on a bigamy charge. He was uh, had had a wife in Missouri, and somehow or other, he thought that the records were lost in a fire back there, so he came down here and went through a ceremony with another woman, and this lady had a child, a little girl, a Mrs. Bindrum here, uh, was at the home when the little girl was born, and so she was taken to Woodward as a witness. When the uh, trial was over, the jury filed out and came back, and uh, the, I, must, I want to put in here that the maximum penalty for bigamy in Oklahoma at that time was seven years imprisonment. So they found the man guilty of bigamy and uh, he, the judge sentenced him and he, uh, he said, uh, Mrs. Bindrum leaned over to uh, Temple Houston, and she says, what did he get? And he said, seven years, madam. She said, is that all? And he said, madam, that is all the thread the court had on his bobbin. That, uh, that was his way of expressing it. Uh, one time, my father never used notes. His mother wanted him to be a, a minister, and he, he took a theology course in Chicago University, but finally decided that that wasn't where he would do the most good. But he always had, as uh, Brooks Bicknell wrote at the time he died, he said he always had at his fingertips a uh, case in point from the Bible, from literature, or from the statutes upon which Oklahoma laws are based and uh, and uh, so he would he would use that well i expect his training in uh, in that stood him in real good stead lots of times yes it, it did it really did and he never he never ever used it and he knows mm -hmm. he I'm sorry, I never saw my father ever plead a case. I, I, I'm very sorry about that. But uh, they just, I was never urged to go and I didn't do it. Uh -huh. My brother and I, they, my mom and papa bought a little red wagon. And when we were tiny, smaller, only 20 years different, 20 months difference in our ages, not years, months. Uh -huh. And he, uh, They'd pull us around the square with that little wagon. And I can remember oh, seeing these things that happened. I One time, Williams Jennings Bryan came here. In 1908, he was, he was campaigning for the presidency on the Democratic ticket. And Mr. Dunn, who was a, a partner with uh, F.M. Cargill in a law office, went down to Oklahoma City to meet Brian and escort him back. They'd go down on this old Rock Island, you know, you could go in the afternoon, be in Oklahoma City by evening, and then the next day you could come back and be here by noon. And so they brought, we're going to bring Mr. Brian up at noon and feed him, have a dinner for him, and then they were going to uh, he was going to speak to the people, and I remember going downtown and, and watching and listening to Mr. Bryan. I don't remember what he said. I mean, it, that didn't impress me because I know it was over my head, but at least I saw him. And uh, he said, uh, so Mrs. Dunn came in tears to Mr. Cargill's office 
because Mr. Dunn had left her with the understanding that she was to prepare the meal for Mr. Bryant. Well, there was a lady here in town who uh, had a wild imagination, but she also felt that she could make better plum pudding than anybody else in the world. And she had to think her things were nicer. And she was going to take over the dinner from Mrs. Dunn. So Mrs. Dunn came down in tears and Mr. Carter said, I'll fix it, Mrs. Dunn. You go on home and make your plans and go along with it. So he called his young son. He said, Russell, come here. And Russell came and he said, I want you to take this to that lady. And uh, he said uh, in the note, we do not want your table linen. We do not want your silver. We do not want your china. We do not want your crystal. We do not want your plum pudding. And we do not want you. And he really got her told. He got her told. <laughs> well, then, um, one time uh, I remember Papa. Oh, that was years later. He came home just giggling. And he had uh, taken a husband's side in a divorce case. And these, uh, this man and this woman were divorced. And uh, she held that against my father. Uh, and I don't think either her husband, her ex-husband, or my father made it hard on her. I think they felt that that was the best thing for everyone concerned. But she held that against Papa. So one day, Papa was walking on one of those diagonal sidewalks of the courthouse, and it said, uh, he met this lady, and he said, uh, good morning. And she said, good morning. Well, he got on a little ways on down, thinking nothing about it, and he heard this voice really, I didn't mean that. And so he, he could always see the the ridiculousness of things. And uh, she spoke to him before she thought. She yes, and she was just and he said another time he had a lady come into the office and he said uh, she said, I just want to tell you that I have been cheated. He said, You have? Yes, I bought a cow and they told me it gave so many gallons of milk and they lied so many gallons of milk because I don't get that. And he said, well, what did you want me to do about it? Oh, nothing, but I was so highly indignified that I wanted you to know it. <laughs> so, and, and that's the way life went on here. We saw, well, we saw paving come. We saw beautiful homes spring up. We, uh, we saw automobiles come. And uh, I heard my mother say, she said, it didn't matter what you wore in the days when they came here. She said, if you had a clean gingham dress or a silk dress, everybody was accepted. And uh, you came here and, and you, you were taken for what you were. Yes, I think we were more inclined to do that then than we are now, maybe. Oh, yes. People, uh, well, they draw so many lines, mm -hmm. so many false lines. Mm -hmm. but I, uh, I watched Papa, he, uh, well, just a year before he died. You see, he practiced law over 60 years here, continuously. And he... He, uh, I can't think what I was going to say. He acted as the county judge. When uh, the judge was gone, he, because they, he had some couple come up from, from out of state and they wanted to be married. And he 
married him. And she said, how come you knew that without having to have a book? And he didn't use a book. He, he said, well, I have learned. And I know something now that I did not know then. But when my husband and I were married in 1922, uh, we asked the Lutheran minister to perform the ceremony. And uh, my father was a Lutheran. My mother was a Congregationalist. I went to all the churches. But when it came to being married, I asked my father if he would like it if we asked Reverend Better, who, of whom I was very fond. I had taught his son in high school, and he used to come to high school. And so he, uh, he said, yes, but I will ask it. And I couldn't think why. And uh, in our vows, I have never heard them before or said, I realize now that young people write their own vows and ministers use them. And I know that's what our younger granddaughter and her husband did. They wrote their own. But this, uh, this pledge that we made to each other was, to me, very beautiful. And I'm sure my father had something to do with it. Uh, because he, they asked my husband, would he promise to love, honor, sustain, <coughs> cherish, and protect? And I was to love, honor, and cherish. There was no obey. <coughs> and uh, I, I feel that my father definitely had something to do with it. It's going to be that. <laughs> And I'm telling you, if all children had parents as gracious and thoughtful as my parents were, <coughs> there would never be a need for a rest home. Mm -hmm. I think you're right. I think good parents <coughs> are what make a child. They really and uh, the, there was never anything, but it was our home, and, they, and he wanted to do what would make us the happiest. I think he One was. thing he did as he lay dying, it was two or three days, but he knew he was not going to live. I was sitting in his room. The nurse had gone down the hall to pick up some supplies. And uh, I, heard, I could see his lips moving. <coughs> his eyes were closed. I went over to the bed. And he was bidding the people of Alva goodbye <coughs> and thanking them for taking him to their hearts. 